Welcome back. I've been lucky enough. I've been reading this great book that it's not fiction. It's, uh, it's called The Three Halves of Eno Mosho. Teachings of the Wizard of the Upper Amazon. Whew. Amazing book. As you probably know, I've already shared a couple talks from it. Good talks out there. So, there's a lot to learn. So, <laughs> those of you out there who stick your noses in the air thinking like, oh, what do I have to learn from primitives, right? <laughs> like, obviously, I'd be surprised if anybody like that is subscribed to me, honestly. I mean, maybe there are people like that, that's fine. You know, you can have your own point of view. Like, we're more refined, we, we don't need this. But honestly speaking, like, you just, you should just give it a shot. And the rest of you, I think you probably are interested, most people who'd be subscribed to me, who like art and original style, stylistic music, something that where I have my own attacks, though you probably like enjoy this book too. Well, if you're old, this is not a young person's book, you know? I could have read this when I was, was 18, and it would have been much harder to understand. I could have read it though, you know, you, you could read it at that age. I don't think it would be bad. I think you'd, it would still be great at, even as a teenager, to read the book. Nonetheless, you know, it is a uh, rather mature book. So, with that preface, I had to preface this book, you know, I don't just jump right in and start giving you all, all of the honey right away, you know, you have to bite a little bit of gram. All right, so this chapter is an amazing chapter. It's going to be uh, a little bit long, there are about five or six, six pages here. And it's called Our Guide Gets Lost. Check this out. I scan the high bush behind me. Not one sign of Ivan. His lateness should concern me, I know, but it is inevitable. After Don Hildebrando, my memory returns to, to Don Javier. It was in La Baguette restaurant in Pucalpa, less than 100 meters away from the Hotel Tariri, where I met that jovial sorcerer, owner of 19 children of his own in four legitimately established homes. Quote, you are very home loving, Don Javier. I smiled at him. That's what they say, he responded, flattered. And some also say that I am 40 years old and that I have 60 million souls. You know that the reverse is true, my friend Soriano, because I have 40 souls and am 60 million years old. Again, he smiled. He was passing by as usual, and as usual was polishing off a glass of San Juan beer, which he interspersed with shots of brandy made with Hipporuru, Clavawaska, or Chuchuwasha. Quote, the Campa, the Campa that followed In Ingeniteri by the thousands refused to join the guerrillas. The rebel Luis de la Puente should have told them that he himself was going to fight for a woman, unquote, and darkening his quiet smile. He should have told them that this, that he was going to rescue a female, that female who some still call, I believe, some still call liberty. 
How was it then that the Campo did go to war with Santos Atahualpa? Was it because they were other men from another time? I ask. The Campa of today are different and they are the same with time. This time is identical. Luis de la Puente was the same. He was white and he was a Viracocha, but in his heart he became an Ashaninka. Within his soul he relieved, he relived Santos Adawalpa, but Santos Adawalpa did not come to the great Pajonal. He came from it. Maybe that's what it was. Don Javier is my godfather, boasted Felix in Sapio while we were navigating toward the Inuya River. He protects me, he said. Stepping off the plain in Adelaide, we came across some German doctors, a couple returning to Pucalpa. He climbed the steps toward the twin-engined plain, arm in arm with his wife, with his eyes lost and white. We were told without asking that the younger stranger had gone deep into the surrounding area, getting lost in the maze of narrow trails used by the Kampa. He spent a whole night not daring to do anything, wounded by the rain and the darkness, exposed to the sightings of vipers, vampires, and fear. The following afternoon, they found him seated, leaning against a leafy shiwawako, covered with ants, insane and numbered and numbed by panic. His wife sobbed while holding his arm, speaking to him and hurrying him into the airplane. Quote, this is a cursed jungle. Someone said the next day, intruding into the anxious group formed by Ivan, Insapio, Cesar, and me, addressing our shining guide in a taunting voice, he said, Is it not true, young Felix? Our jungle is beautiful, but very cursed, full of apparitions, of snakes, of lizards, of Otorongos. You know that better than anyone else, no? Then we found out that some years back, Felix Incipio had become lost in that area. He wandered about for several days alone, without a compass, firearms, or anything. Innumerable expeditions searched for him in vain. He had already been given up as dead when he suddenly reappeared, a wreck, in the path that goes from the cemetery to the town. It was two in the morning. Taking advantage of his habitual insomnia, I questioned Felix in Sapio about it on the night we made camp after, the, after nearly sinking the canoe. But before transcribing what the guide told me, I must say something else about Don Javier. Five kilometers down river from the mouth of the Unine, on the same bank where the forests of bloodwood shine, lies the property of an affable Spaniard named Andres Rua. Don Andreas Rua is 50-ish, but looks like his own son. He is massive, although veined with a wrinkle here and there, especially on the hands. The tops of his hands are full of white hairs, as is his copious mane. His mustache is stained by tobacco, 
or by a stubborn, probably blonde adolescence. His face has uncertain cheekbones, tending toward evening reds. Ten years ago, he was given up by the specialist in the Lima Hospital to neoplastic diseases, made mute by throat cancer. Don Andres Rua refused to have his larynx removed. Quote, I will leave this world with everything I brought with me, unquote. And he returned to the jungle, resigned to die. Back on his property, he came across Don Javier. With no hope at all about his cancer, he limited himself to consulting Don Javier about a circulatory difficulty that painfully affected his joints. In exchange for boarding with him for a few days, he was prescribed an infusion of Garapatakosha, a spiny vine abundant in the trees of that region. Drinking daily from that golden water, Don André Rua healed not only his circular afflictions, to the amazement of the cancer specialists who incredulously examined him, the Garabatakasha had stopped the death gnawing at his throat. When I was introduced to Don André Rua in the bar of the Grand Hotel de Souza, in front of the central square of Atalia, he could already drink cold beer and smoke fearlessly and he laughed and spoke with a voice only distantly scratchy. And now, let's hear Felix Incipio's story from the strapping, coppery, proud godson of Don Javier. Quote, That afternoon, I was traveling to Pucalpa. I had my seat in the airplane already reserved. I was flying for the first time. My godfather, Don Javier, wanted to give me that experience out of affection. Since it was early, to kill time and to say goodbye to the jungle, as I thought I was leaving it forever, I decided to take a stroll. The previous night I had dreamed about Juan Gonzalez. Juan Gonzalez told me not to travel. He told me that in the dream. But I did. I took a stroll, as you see me now, without boots or machete. I got lost because of my pride in thinking I knew everything. I followed a wide path for a long time, looking here and there to the better looking branches, saying goodbye to them. I considered returning and did not and did turn around to go back when the sun was burning bright in the middle of the sky, directly above me. I looked upon a madhouse, an infinity of identical trails spread before me, crossing each other. Partly guessing, I picked one. Praying that it would be mine, I walked and walked, worse then I heard the noise of my arriving plane. I went faster. I became, became tired without avail. I kept going, nothing. Before I realized it, suddenly it was dusk and I told myself, Felix, you are lost. Now, more than ever, you must be in Sapio. You must be the son of your father and your mother, you must remain calm because you should know that even the smallest animals can smell fear. If you let fear take you over, you are a dead man. The tigers will hunt you, the rattlesnakes, and even the bees will hunt you. And I sat to one side of the trail to breathe deeply to calm myself down. Slowly I became calmer. I searched for a tree to sleep in before it became dark, 
away from the reach of wild animals. The snakes already began to be heard, invisible among the dry leaves on the ground. The rattles murmured. I selected a tree, a medium-sized young charicuelo. I climbed it. There I spent the night tied to the highest branch with the rope I used as a belt. I hardly slept. I came down with the first light. Again, I walked and walked, but this time I began to eliminate trails as the Kampa do, the Ashaninka, cracking small branches to the right as I went in the direction of my travel. In that way, when the trails appeared to confuse me again, I could tell, thanks to the broken branches, which trails I had already traversed and which I had not. I discarded trails until sunset. Again, I selected another tree. Because the night came so suddenly, it gave me no time. I had to climb the nearest one, a medium thick one rising next to a tsangapia. Have you ever seen a tsangapia? It is a beautiful plant. It is a bush that produces only one flower, a single one. And that flower is enormous with an orange color and a delightful perfume. And it is a hot flower. The skin of the tsanga pia petal, petals is warm, just as you're hearing it. That flower is very hot. It appears to be more an animal than a flower. When you cut it, it begins to cool very slowly, gradually losing its perfume as well. As they lose their heat, they lose their aroma, or vice versa. It is the same. Once cut, once plucked from its stem, the Tsangapia flower doesn't live more than seven days. That happened to me a week after I was lost my soul began to get colder. I started losing my courage. I lost all hope. I had to hurry. Drawing strength from I know not where, I climbed the nearest tree just to one side of the Tsangapia. Darkness prevented identification, but judging by the wrinkles of its bark, I believed it was a Tortuga Caspi. The cursed tree was thick, at least it was crisscrossed by ropes, its trunk covered by chaotic hairy vines. Holding on to them, I began to climb. I barely reached the top with a little, a little breath left, sweating and cursing. It was then I lost my belt. A rope newer than this one I'm carrying now. It was so high that perhaps it was not a Tortuga Caspi. Could it have been a Machi Mango? Perhaps because I was received by a pleasant odor when I reached the height, as high as possible. I leaned against one of its branches, half dead from sleeplessness and hunger and close to suffocation. I could not sleep that night either. A tremendous itch invaded my shoulders the back of my legs, my neck, and my waist. I almost jumped in desperation. It was so dark, I could not distinguish anything. I swept my right hand over my back, scratching myself madly in the full darkness, and smelled my fingers. They smelled of pure, stinking acid. That tree was the home of ants a nauseating nest of ishinshimis, great ants that make up for their lack of venom with a fetid and painful sting. I wished that I were a bullet and the trunk was greased so I could come down faster. I grasped a vine and started to slide down, cursing. I don't know how in the hell the vine broke, as I was still grabbing it with my hands, and I fell all the way to the ground. It was night. I could not see. 
I could not judge the distance to the ground. That is why I crashed standing up without bending my knees like a poor ass, stiffer than a spear. I wanted to be a bullet, but it is so funny. Instead of a bullet, I came down like a spear. That is where I damaged my spine. I doubled over with pain that I don't want to remember. With my face lying on the soil, I heard the snakes. Very near, surely disporting themselves on the wet grass, dry and wetted by the drizzle. And I could not even stand up. I could not even stand up for several hours. To this day, I don't know why the snakes did not bite me. Finally, when I could stand the pain, I rose halfway and thought, the only way out was to keep on walking. I had no strength left to climb trees. I walked and walked in the darkness, feeling my way with my foot to avoid straying from the path and going deeper into the woods. I searched for hard soil, for the hardness of the compressed soil in the path, shunning the softness of the grass, with, which would lead me nowhere. Walking in this way, covered my face with cobwebs. Several hours later, sleepy against my will, I leaned on a pomegranate, which had a strong, nice smell. There, I was bitten by a vampire in this arm. It was lucky that I woke up, because these vampires are noiseless. They are not betrayed by their wings or their bite. Their saliva first numbs you, and they need not suck your blood. With their saliva, they also put an anticoagulant in the bite and your blood oozes out while you feel nothing. I was lucky to wake up, thanks to the fact that again I had a dream about Juan Gonzalez that night. I dreamed I was floating in midair, floating just before falling down with the ground far below me, when Juan Gonzalez peered out from behind the sun and said, you have to walk. I told him, how could I with, with no path below my feet? He shouted, you have to keep walking and pushed me with his right hand, which was very warm. And his hand was a Tsanga Pia flower. It was the smell of his hand that woke me up, frightened and not comprehending. I started walking again, holding my wet sleeve, my shirt warmed by the blood. Somewhat further on, I came across a clearing in the darkness, a black space full of small fixed lights like eyes that were watching me. Fireflies, Ayanyawis, eyes of the dead, they could not be. They did not twinkle, neither could they be tiger's pupils so close together. I panicked. I was frightened and at the same time controlled my fright. If they smell my fear, they will kill me, I thought. I reached out to the closest little lights. They did not move. I touched them. They were branches. I breathed deeply and felt relieved. It was moss that accumulated on the cavities of dead trees, moss that is nothing during the day and goes unnoticed, but at night shines better than 100 little lamps. I went back to walking with confidence, always feeling my way with my foot in the darkness. I came across a creek, drank like a madman and lay down in the grass. Then I remembered, if I follow the course of the creek, sooner or later, I will reach a bigger river. And if I reach that, I am saved. Some traveler or some fisherman will rescue me. I waded into the water laughing and went walking over the stones in the middle of the creek. I was so confused that in order to know which way the creek was flowing, instead of using a leaf, I tore off a piece of my shirt and put it on, on the water. I could not see, 
touching the strip of cloth that was moving, looking through my fingers, I could determine which way the creek was flowing. I walked with water up to my chest, sometimes over my head. I walked and walked until I could hear very near in front of me the roar of the ukayali. I was about to hurry when I noticed that the creek ended. The accursed creek ended some miles before entering the river. It dispersed into a gigantic swamp. It was impossible to continue. I remembered that swamps are full of snakes. And I also remembered that all the creeks, all of the ravines, and also the smallest rivulets in that area are inhabited by the small, black, deadly, venomous viper called Naka Naka, and by another, even more ferocious one called the Yaku Jergon. You guys got to get this book for the glossary alone. Trying to cover up my fear, I began to backtrack along the creek. I went for hours fighting against the current, thinking I would be killed at any instant by a snake. Finally, I arrived at a clearing, left the creek, and collapsed in the grass in surrender. I give up, I said. But no, I am confused. What I am telling you now happened days later on the seventh night. Let the critters eat me, and I fell unconscious. <coughs> Sometime later, I thought of my godfather, Don Javier, a very, a very clearly, I, I very clearly remembered that one time he told me, Godson, when you are in trouble, call me, fix your thoughts on me, and call me with confidence and I will help you. I closed my eyes and began to call him. I remained that way for a long time with closed eyes lying on the grass, calling him. I felt nothing, I heard nothing. I opened my eyes and saw nothing. I raised my head, then I saw. Then I saw through the ceiling of branches ahead of me, a multitude of yellowish lights, like oil or kerosene lamps over the huge trees. They must be my friends, I said to myself to give myself courage. They must have hung their lanterns in the crown of the highest lupuna to orient me. I started walking in the direction of the lamps. Later, entering another clearing in the forest, I could have a better look. They were not lamps. It was the moon, shattered very high behind the branches. A cursed moon, I yelled, knowing well that it was not the real moon I had seen, but only its reflection in my soul, the reflection of the lamps, what my hope wished to see. I collapsed, this time forever on the grass. But right then, immediately, I thought that Don Javier had made me believe that they were lanterns, that they were signal lamps, so that I could return to him. In that way, driven by an idiotic illusion, I kept walking toward the moon. It was not, however, an idiotic illusion. It was the moon of my godfather that was lighting my way and dictating my path. I did not walk in vain. Further on, I was stopped by laughter. The laughter came from the left, and one could hear it clearly. It was the laughter of Don Javier. I deviated from the path that led in the direction of the moon. It was a full moon. I shall never know why it shone so in that sky, because it was not its time. Neither shall I know why I could never see it in the previous nights or those that followed. I followed a very narrow trail to the left. At this hour of night, I wondered, at this hour of night, my godfather is living it up. Surely he must be with a young woman. I thought then, forgetting that my godfather could not be anywhere around because he was waiting for me in Pucalpa. And in spite of days without food or sleep, 
seven days of fasting like a sorcerer, feeding myself only with a piece of plantain and with ravine water, I moved resolutely toward the laughter, forcing my way between the branches and pushing away vines and bushes I could not see. I could hear the laughter more clearly every time I became discouraged. When I heard it, I recovered my determination. I went after it with renewed persistence, and I heard the laughter ever closer, sharper, clearer. That was the way in which I returned, safe and sound, when everyone had given me up for dead. Once again, Tom's Gauntlet with you, reading from the three halves of Eno Mosho, Teachings of the Wizard of the Upper Amazon, published by Inner Traditions.